Again, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Anne-Marie Montero. And again, I told you she's an assistant professor of medicine at the IU School of Medicine. She's also the medical director of the Behavioral Health Services at IU Health North. And again, really pleased to have her because I don't think that we talk about mental health enough. So um, she's talked to a lot of patients on our focus groups, our support groups on Zoom, and she's done a number of web-based interventions for us. So it's an always, always a delight because she cares so genuinely about this disease and again, the plight of patients. So thank you again, Dr. Montero. Thank you, Dr. Lambert. I am challenged height-wise. <laughs> Hopefully had a good, good uh, balance here for you. I know after lunch, it's exceptionally hard to sit and uh, be still for another talk. So I wonder before we begin, if everybody wants to, if you are interested, you might want to just stretch in your seats, just give your body a chance to reach for the stars and lean to both sides. Feel free to stand up and move around, shake it out. Get your body uh, ready to uh, take in some good information. This is so important, and I'm deeply honored to be here with you today. So hopefully I will be able to navigate this smoothly. Um, I have poll questions. I was delighted Dr. Lammert had, and his whole team, thank you to Aaron Anderson as well, uh, for getting us set up with the poll questions. I'd rather this be interactive. I'm going to try to move quickly past the parts that I think might be a little less uh, interesting, but just important context so that we have time for some discussion, I hope, today. But it's an honor to be here. I've been in practice almost 20 years. I am a health psychologist, which means I work at what I think is the most interesting intersection in the world of the mind-body connection. So psychoneuroimmunology is a fancy word that means that place where our um, conscious consciousness comes into contact with physical manifestation in the body. And we have all kinds of interesting interactions there. And where those interactions occur, we also have the potential to harness that synergy to help improve our experience. So we'll talk about some of the connections today uh, that relate to mental health symptoms as well as physical symptoms and common side effects or common symptoms of autoimmune hepatitis, but also ways to help harness that interaction for your benefit to try to make the best of your circumstances and help you feel empowered to move forward. Okay. So uh, briefly, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Well, Craig, let's see. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Technologically handicapped here. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know what images come to mind for you when you were first introduced to the concept of autoimmune hepatitis. I was particularly drawn to the woman who was face down near her coffee. I think the feeling of, uh, this may be an exaggeration, but the feeling of having a hard time going on is really common for many of my patients. Uh, I also think a close proximity to your medical care team, the feeling of being connected, but also under evaluation, and hopefully having support is in the mix of what you experience. So I thought we'd begin with a poll question. Uh, thanks to Dr. Lambert et al. At the, at the top of your polls, if you can just give a sense if you're comfortable, these are anonymous, of course, uh, indicating how you feel about awareness of your health condition, um, ranging from overwhelmed to feeling unsure, anxious, or even optimistic and positive for the future. So I'll give that just a moment. It looks like people are feeling moderately split. A good cohort in the middle um, is feeling neutral, uh, although a substantial portion, 40%, are saying they're anxious about the future of their health. And importantly, 11%, 13% now say they are feeling overwhelmed. So this is something as a healthcare provider in tandem with my colleagues in medicine, I would want to attend to very carefully. Thank you for your candor about that. 
We contextualize autoimmune hepatitis as a rare disease, one of many that affects less than 10% of the population, but among those many, it means resources are spread out thinly. And as Dr. Nephew pointed out earlier, we need more research, more awareness. You all are helping us take a step toward all of that today, even in uh, the, uh, things like participating in this poll data. Every place we can have contact with people who are on the front lines of experiencing this, this is going to help us. But being part of a rare disease population means that we are also at risk for feeling uh, some negative experiences like isolation or limited social support because people don't know about things that are rare as often. So I would put uh, this conversation in the context of uh, discussion around wellness with recognition that it has multiple dimensions, physical wellness being obviously a critically important part of that. But I would emphasize this is, uh, there are other dimensions that we can also access and help support patients on and think of this as a proactive state, not just like the absence of disease or absence of distress, hopefully, but something that's above and beyond that that we can help people aspire to and hopefully achieve. So I'd like to ask about how overall, before we get into the nitty gritty, autoimmune hepatitis has affected your lives, uh, ranging from a significantly negative or somewhat negative way to minimally or being even unsure or having positive effects. There's something called um, post-traumatic growth that can occur even with severe diagnoses like cancer, after people have experienced negative health ex um, symptoms or um, even sometimes devastating experiences, they can emerge with a very different emotional uh, outcome that they say sometimes has spiritual like silver linings. So I included that as a way to acknowledge there can be a range of reactions. And Allowing that for a moment to come in, it looks like the vast majority is saying a somewhat negative uh, impact from autoimmune hepatitis at 53%. But if we include a significant negative impact, we're up into the 70s. So there's a vast majority of people who are indicating there's something really heavy about this condition that has affected them. We'll get into the details of your experience here as we proceed. Thank you for that feedback. I would ask about the, um, or let's go ahead right now and ask about the details. Back to that wellness wheel that I had the dimensions outlined. Could you all share, please, your top two areas that it's affected you? Physically, quality of life. We know Dr. Lambert's research has um, helped us understand a lot about the ways that's been affected by autoimmune hepatitis, psychological, uh, symptoms, relationships, or the impact of fatigue, the ability to do things that you want to do. So it looks like physical wellness is by far the top factor at 45%. Are you all able to see these numbers as they come in? As well, okay, great, so I don't have to narrate that. So that, that I would just acknowledge is um, heavy and not unexpected. Um, but I'm, I'm noticing as well the relatively low impact on relationships. That speaks volumes to the social support infrastructure that you already have in place. And hopefully the medical and uh, other ancillary healthcare team support that you may feel. So with that, we know that there are um, significant uh, factors that impact quality of life along those dimensions, including um, uh, even when disease is technically under control, we expect, and the re research shows, that quality of life um, ha is affected um, by autoimmune hepatitis. If we go to that next question and ask you directly, has autoimmune hepatitis affected your quality of life? I'm seeing at least somewhat for the majority of people, and if we include significantly, that's almost... 83%, no, 80, gosh, almost nine, no, uh, over 80% of people. That, that is a heavy majority of people who feel that this has uh, changed their lives. And 
Fatigue can be a central component, uh, as many presenters have identified today. Um, there's a lot of ways to uh, slice and dice the uh, symptoms. Uh, one division uh, is along central versus peripheral lines, but either way, we expect that um, fatigue and joint pain are um, among the symptoms that can contribute heavily to quality of life challenges, and then that impacts us in terms of behavior and what we're able to get done. I heard people talking earlier on the patient panel about how to manage um, fatigue when that affects things that they would like to do. And some people were saying um, what we clinically call pacing, that they try to measure their behavior, kind of like spreading out icing on top of a cake, making sure you have, um, don't spend all of your resources in one area. If you do, I tend to find patients will have like a, a boomerang kind of um, pattern or like, um, like a seesaw that's spread out. If they overspend, then they will not only tend to feel depleted energy-wise, but it has mood impact. And usually they're fairly, um, uh, not only exhausted physically, but also emotionally. And that tends to lower, of course, your activity, but unfortunately it also impacts sleep. And so we tend to have so, sort of a, a cyclical pattern that then occurs if it disrupts sleep. You can guess what that does to mood. Many of you may know this firsthand. That can increase irritability, like uh, what I call low shock absorbers for your experiences during the day. And with those resources not as robustly in place, people tend to feel more sad or more anxious, which of course then does what to sleep? It erodes that further. So I think of this like the recycling arrows going in a circle that they can um, contribute reciprocally to one another, and that's just one layer of the distress. Worry about your illness can be another um, feature like that. The more that um, we experience anxiety, that tends to also erode sleep, um, erode our well-being, and that tends to, instead of boosting uh, functioning or productivity, it tends to kind of take away from that, which then further erodes uh, emotional well-being. So let me ask you all directly about symptoms um, of energy and fatigue here with awareness that uh, fatigue is a predominant symptom that we recognize as multifactorial. I just identified these um, compounding challenges here at the bottom. So if I ask um, you all directly if you can help share your experience, I'm imagining the majority of people will land on the heavy or debilitating side, but I appreciate being aware of what your experience has been like. Giving this a moment to come in, it looks like people are coping far better than I um, was anticipating, you might say. There's, there's a majority landing in yes, somewhat, um, but I'm coping, so a sense of kind of a uh, taking it in stride and moving forward despite this being so heavy, which is really remarkable. While we're responding, let me ask immediately also about pain. Joint pain or abdominal pain is unfortunately sometimes part of this experience, and I'm interested to know about how that affects you. Looks like almost half of the respondents so far are saying pain is minimally interfering. So I'm thrilled that that's not as predominant, although I understand that fatigue can be just uh, crippling at times. So that's remained close to 50%, giving that a moment to come in. So that it sounds like fatigue is, is um, by far the greater um, uh, physical symptom challenge. So let's shift to some more um, traditional psychological symptom focus here. Um, this is called the biopsychosocial model. This is intended to capture some main buckets of um, factors that affect our experience. If you think of the human experience in the middle where it says health, we would think of physical factors, mental and emotional factors, and then under the social heading, I always break that out to specify both inner and outer domains, inner being your own, 
behavioral response, and outer being things in your environment and your relationships that so may affect you by what's going on around you, within you, and then your thoughts, feelings, and physical experience that all overlap to contribute to the human condition. So with that, we know that there's significant risk of distress, again, especially given fatigue and quality of life factors. There are numerous studies that have already established that patients are more at risk for both anxiety and depression when they have autoimmune hepatitis, again, even when physical disease state is relatively controlled. There's a higher risk, by the way, for women. And the studies have ranged in um, identifying the rates of uh, anxiety and depression. This particular study that I cite here at the top had a much higher threshold for identifying uh, depression. They used on the PHQ-9 a score of 15, which is near the ceiling. So that qualified as moderately severe symptoms, which were present remarkably in 60% of patients. Let me slow down for a minute. That means two-thirds of the people who had autoimmune hepatitis that were surveyed, and this was a robust study, had moderately severe symptoms of depression. That for sure merits our attention and treatment. And about two-thirds of them were severe enough to warrant being offered a prescription. We would always want to offer that in tandem with psychotherapy as well, clinically. Anxiety in this study only um, ranged in the 20s, 20% 20 range, but I suspect that it is likely much higher if we include focus on health-related worry. Sometimes phrasing around anxiety tends to be kind of um, specific for people, and uh, we want to be be sure to uh, be encompassing enough to include not only um, explicit worry that might like me. Uh, independent definitions uh, for anxiety, but health-related worry tends to be um, take many forms um, when we have medical challenges. So that can, that can range from feeling like I don't know enough about my condition or not knowing what my uh, results will be before labs. There tends to be a, an increase in worry, understandably, before testing or medical visits. Uh, but sometimes in the long lulls between visits, um, there can be increase in worry. Um, some patients tend to cope better when they have less contact with the team. They can kind of recover and gather their resources with their own social support system apart from the medical network. Other people do well when they have close contact with their providers and they can get information and uh, hopefully reassurance um, and honest feedback about wherever they stand. So I would just add, as Dr. Nephew described before, we know that this condition uh, predisposes people to more distress than other conditions in the autoimmune family. Uh, some of them, uh, for example, this study contrasted general arthritis, like osteoarthritis, and unfortunately, patients with autoimmune hepatitis indeed uh, ranked higher with risk of both depression and anxiety. Interestingly, there was a study that showed some protective factors, or um, at least, let's say, lower correlation of um, distress with uh, people who were minorities. This is not typically the experience. We, um, Dr. Nephew earlier talked about social uh, determinants of health, and we want to stay, importantly, very attuned to that, but at least in this study, people who had uh, African American, Hispanic, and I think Asians were included as well, Asian heritage, had lower anxiety and depression ratings than people who were Caucasian. So just uh, for your awareness, that's some, some context there. But let me ask you directly about your experience with autoimmune hepatitis and mental health. And it, this is, of course, anonymous, but if you're comfortable responding, how has autoimmune hepatitis affected your mood. I would ask you to include your present mood as well as your history of mood. In other words, if you've had depression in the past, I believe I have to respond to see the responses myself. So it looks like people aren't endorsing disabling experiences, thankfully 
but there is a, a uh, looks like kind of a split between somewhat of a challenge and minimal challenge. So I'm delighted to hear that that's not as heavy for everyone, but it sounds like that's somewhat present for um, at least the, the majority of people who responded. And if you go two questions down, it looks like this got um, slightly out of order, but if we ask about anxiety, I think this may get left out of the slide, sorry, but um, I'll, I'll just talk through it. If I ask about uh, how autoimmune hepatitis has affected your degree of worry or anxiety, including health anxiety, I'm seeing an even greater uh, majority indicating somewhat um, they have experienced anxiety, but they feel they're coping. I'll give a moment for that to come in. So if you're endorsing that even to a moderate degree, I would emphasize you are not alone and highlight that cascading relationship again where we experience um, mood uh, and anxiety as impacting your well-being that affects your physical status, including sleep, your ability to get things done, which in turn predisposes people for more mood or anxiety symptoms. So they kind of reinforce one another. But we can manage this proactively, not only with social support, um, I've kind of tried to draw these concentric circles to show the intention for um, your experience to be um, concept, conceptualized like a, if you threw a stone in a pond and you had those rings rippling out around it. There's a line in the um, literature on wellness and burnout that says, beware the con of individual resilience. That's a fancy way to say, the onus is not on you to cope with this alone. We expect the onus is also on healthcare providers and the larger community, in addition to your own uh, private network of social support uh, to come alongside you in this journey to the degree that you want to have them there. But it's our responsibility to make sure that that's offered in my view. So with that, we want to appropriately bring that support alongside you, but also look at ways that we can um, intersect with social support that's beneficial for you. Social support is complicated because, as we mentioned at the beginning, this is a rare condition and lots of people don't know a lot of uh, detail about what autoimmune hepatitis means. And one of the patients, um, I think Brooke said it very well when she said people skip hearing autoimmune and jump to focus on hepatitis. And that carries a lot of stigma for a number of people. I think they, they have implication or expectation that that may connote either um, contagion, like they might get it, or alcohol abuse, that they have associated that um, mentally, which is, is unfair and un inaccurate uh, for autoimmune hepatitis, but it's also stigmatizing in ways that can be emotionally distressing. And so I think people avoid sharing out of fear that people may not understand what it is, but they also may prejudge. Um, and people, sometimes people aren't comfortable disclosing about their health even if there weren't stigma, but especially in this case, that's a challenge. Another challenge that affects social support is the aspects of what's called in the literature invisible illness. Uh, some of the symptoms are not um, explicitly seen on the outside. For example, if you have a handicap tag and you walk on into Kroger, um, people, I've, I've even seen this happen, people can stop you and say, what, why are you doing that? Which I cannot fathom um, the, the umbrage of doing so, but it's, it makes people feel, I think, especially vulnerable when they have variable symptoms or symptoms that they're experiencing privately they may or may not want others to know about, but they don't have that badge of um, exhibition of their symptoms on the outside. For example, with cancer, if people lose their hair, most people identify that with cancer and have kind of a script for what that means they are expected to do to bring support. In this case, people don't know what you're experiencing and they're not sure how they should respond. 
Uh, pain is another um, so pseudo-invisible sign like that that can be tremendously disabling and variable, by the way. Pain isn't always the same every day. Fatigue isn't the same every day. But in that variance, when people see someone functioning, they may assume that that's how they feel much of the time. And that's not typical uh, for symptoms to be super consistent. Um, or for some people, they may have patterns within the day for, that they, for example, may have more energy in the morning but wear out by afternoon or evening. Uh, but that's very individualized. And so people cope with this in a number of ways. I want to be mindful of the time, but briefly, some people tend to minimize their needs or keep them um, to themselves or defer them, continue to function in roles where they may have been um, very other-focused. Um, others may be open and asking for what they need um, with support, but often they report inner reverberations from that, like having guilt or anxiety. And so that's something I would en encourage you to openly discuss with your social support um, network of resources. Um, we have tons of research support to say social support is one of the best ways to feel better. Being connected to others in ways that are meaningful to you not only helps emotionally, but it actually has physical bearing. I mentioned that interaction of where the body manifests these intangible or psychological variables. Um, it's one of the special resources that we know has um, protective resources for the heart, uh, for the immune system, for the nervous system, et cetera. So we can enhance protective factors within our control. I think, Dr. Lambert, are we at the end of our time, or can we? OK. So let me just briefly highlight, if you can be more positive and assert control where you actually have it, you're likely to not only improve your mental health, but you have a chance of improving your physical health outcomes as well. People do better when they manifest these variables as opposed to these. So keeping your emotions expressed, which means being aware of them in the first place, bringing them to a safe place, and then finding something that you can focus on that's within what we call your locus of control. So this, these slides will be available um, thanks to Dr. Lambert and his team, but I would just add that places where you can um, have proactive stewardship of health behaviors, like for example, sleep hygiene. Uh, Dr. Matthew Walker, the sleep guru, says seven hours is the magical threshold there. So trying to keep that in a good place, uh, optimizing your social support, and then um, specifically on navigating alcohol. If we have time, I'm glad to take questions, but I know that's a sensitive point um, that we covered earlier. So being aware of your environment and your likelihood to receive support may help um, help optimize the potential for outcome and minimize anxiety. So I wish we had more time. I'm so appreciative of the chance to be here. If we have time, I'm glad to take questions, but if not, thank you. For just a, a few questions, if, if there are one. Hi. It's not just for you, doctor, but for the entire panel. If for the self-image and um, for everything else for our mental health, the name is such a harmful um, problem. Why hasn't it been changed? We do it amongst ourselves, and we call it autoimmune liver disease. Why can't the medical profession do that as well and get rid of that hepatitis, which will take so much off our plates? And I, I would acknowledge that stigma is part of the challenge and add to that, it's within your control what you call this. First of all, you don't, it's up to you that you call it or don't share that. But if you do, you could say, I have an autoimmune condition that affects the liver. Or I have an autoimmune condition. It is, uh, you, no one, no one uh, is married to that language. So. Sure. I understand. Sure. Oh, yeah, I appreciate the heaviness that reverberates along with that. I, real, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, so again, just a sidebar, uh, there was a recent nomenclature change for fatty liver disease. 
And when I learned the past few years of what this took to get this name change, I mean, millions of dollars, multiple meetings, patient leadership, multiple physician leaders, uh, hepatitis is a dirty word, there's no doubt. Uh, this has been done in another disease, primary biliary cholangitis, got rid of cirrhosis. It is feasible. It's something to think as a nonprofit, as we talk about unmet needs, is this something as an organization paired with patients that we need to attack? And again, we need to start thinking about that in the next three to five years, kind of what that plan and game plan looks like from an advocacy standpoint and what the leadership looks like to make that happen. So we hear you. It's not insurmountable, but it's possible. Dr. Weinberg is here from Penn. Maybe I can ask him. In terms of thoughts of a name change of a disease, is this a feasible thing that a national nonprofit could lead with patients behind it? Yeah, it could happen. I think there would also need to be a, a name that uh, made sense to change to. So um, it, took, it took years to be able to change fatty liver disease to steatotic liver disease, but when I talk to patients about fatty liver disease, I still I have to explain to them what steatosis means, and I still use the word fatty. So it, it actually becomes very tricky. Um, and, and so name change is possible, but there'll need to be an alternative name that encumbers what we see um, on the pathology slide, too. So for the consideration of time, we'll probably go ahead and move forward. Thank you, Dr. Montero. We really appreciate it.